Welcome back for part three of the immune system, where we are going to finish up with the innate defenses, and then we'll begin on the active ones. So the innate defenses that we have left to talk about are the interferons, which are small proteins that are going to be released by lymphocytes and macrophages. They will be activated. Once they're activated, they can trigger production of antiviral proteins, which don't actually kill the viruses, but will block them from replicating in the cell. So that's gonna slow down the spread. Interferons are one type of cytokine. Cytokines are chemical messengers released by tissue cells that are very important to the, the immune response. So the types of interferons include alpha, which is produced by cells that are infected with viruses. These are going to stimulate the natural killer cells that we previously talked about. Beta interferons are going to be secreted by fibroblasts, and these will help to slow down inflammation. Interferon gamma is secreted by T cells and natural killer cells, and these are going to stimulate macrophage activity. So remember the large eating cells. Complement systems. So there are more than 30 special complement proteins in the plasma. These guys are going to help antibodies to destroy pathogens. They're going to work together. These proteins will work together in cascades. We're going to see some examples of this in just a minute. And there are three main routes of activation. We have the classical, the lectin, and the alternative pathway. So focusing in on classical first, this is one of the most effective modes of activation. It's going to begin with the binding of complement protein C1 to two antibodies attached to the antigen. The bound protein will then act like an enzyme, which will catalyze a chain reaction. Okay, so let's check out the classical pathway. So what we have here is a bacterium that has invaded the tissue, invaded the body. And on the surface of the bacterium are antibodies. C1 is a complement protein that we were talking about. It's going to attach itself to the two antibodies. It then is going to act as an enzyme. Several reactions will occur with other complement proteins. An inactive C3 becomes C3B and will attach itself to the bacterial cell wall. Okay, so again, we have our C1 complement protein grabbing on to two antibodies at once. C1 acts as an enzyme. Some reactions will occur with other complement proteins. And C3, which is normally inactive, will become C3B and will attach to the bacterial cell wall. And what's cool about this is C3B actually causes pores in the bacterial wall and then lysis or attract phagocytes. So let's slow that down a little bit. If we look right here, it almost looks like little needles. That's kind of how I like to imagine it. Poking pores in the bacterial wall. So then the bacteria will lyse or burst open. It also might instead attract phagocytes to make the bacteria easier to eat or engulf. Or it could cause mast cells to release histamine. Histamine will cause inflammation and increase blood flow to the area. So these are three options for what we might do to kill this bacteria. We might poke holes in it. We might make it easier to eat by phagocytes. Or we may cause mast cells to come in and release inflammation to increase blood flow to the area, which will bring in more cells to help us get rid of the problem. The alternative pathway is when several complement proteins, including one called properdin, will interact in the plasma and respond to bacteria. This will also result 
in the attachment of a C3B protein to the bacterial wall, and then the three options can possibly occur. So the lectin pathway of complement activation, we're going to see MBL, which is mannose binding lectin. It's going to bind to carbs on the pathogen surface. And the alternative pathway, one of which we mentioned, is going to involve properdin or factor P. This begins when several complement proteins interact. So it could be the factor P or factor B or factor D. These are common ones in the alternative pathway. All three complement system pathways will involve turning inactive C3 protein to activated C3B. Remember the little guy with the little needles on the bottom, or it looks like little needles. Um, so we're going to convert C3 to activated C3B and C3A proteins. This will kill the pathogen by cell lysis, as we mentioned. It can enhance phagocytosis, which is known as opsonization, so make it easier to eat, or inflammation caused by the release of histamine from the mast cells. So inflammation, this is where a localized tissue will respond to an injury by any stimulus that can harm the cells or injure tissues. It's a localized tissue response to an injury triggered by any stimulus that can harm the cells or injure the tissues. And some of the typical symptoms we're going to see with inflammation include redness, swelling, pain, and also heat. The effects of inflammation, so how does it actually help? Well, it's going to temporarily repair the injury and will help to prevent additional germs or pathogens from entering the wound, so that's a huge plus. It's also going to slow the spread of pathogens to surrounding areas, and it can actually mobilize local or systemic defenses, so it's going to bring in backup, pretty much. This will assist in overcoming the pathogens and help us to begin regeneration. Sometimes inflammation can produce necrosis, which is tissue damage. It could also cause or produce pus, which is a mixture of fluid, dead and dying cells, and also parts of necrotic tissue. Or even an abscess, which is an accumulation of pus in an enclosed area. So these can be quite painful and sometimes even rupture. So a body temperature greater than 37.2 degrees Celsius or 99 degrees Fahrenheit is considered technically a fever. And what this will do is it increases your metabolism, accelerates the defenses, and can inhibit some microbes. So there are many microbes that really don't like to get too hot. So as your body temperature goes up, it's going to inhibit them. Pyrogens are fever-inducing agents. These are going to be produced by microbes that cause the hypothalamus to raise your body temperature. So fevers can be really, really good things. We don't want them to go crazy high, but we do want a little bit to help inhibit the growth of the pathogens. So we're turning the corner now into adaptive defenses. Adaptive or specific defenses are going to result from coordinated activities of T cells and B cells. T cells and B cells. So the main types of T cells we have listed here include the cytotoxic T cells. These guys attack antigens physically and also chemically. Helper T cells which will help stimulate responses of T cells and B cells. So just like their name implies, they're going to help. Regulatory T cells will help to moderate immune response. And memory T cells will respond to antigens that you have come across before in your life. 
types of regulatory T cells are inflammatory T cells and suppressor or inducer T cells. The B cells will differentiate into plasma cells, which will produce and secrete antibodies to fight those antigens. Natural killer cells make up about 5 to 10% of circulating lymphocytes. 5 to 10%. So here's a little review, and it kind of puts everything together into one little neat picture, which is great for studying. So of our lymphocytes, we have T cells, NK cells, and B cells. So let's start with our B cells. So the B cells will produce plasma cells. When they're stimulated, B cells differentiate into plasma cells, which can make and secrete antibodies. The natural killer cells will provide non-specific immunity. So they're going to attack foreign cells that are infected with viruses and also cancer cells. T cells come in four categories. We have cytotoxic, which will attack foreign cells infected by viruses. Helper, which stimulate activation of T and B cells. Suppressor, which can inhibit the activation of T and B cells. And memory, which can respond to an antigen they've seen before. Cell mediated immunity or cellular immunity is provided by the cytotoxic T cells. This is going to help us to defend against abnormal cells and pathogens inside of the cells. Antibody mediated immunity is provided by the B cells. It's going to defend against antigens and pathogens in your body fluids. So a reminder what antigens are. We've mentioned it before, but we're going to bring it up again just to be sure. So antigens are chemical targets that will stimulate an immune response. So whenever a lymphocyte contacts an antigen, it will activate it. This activated lymphocyte will then divide to create a clone. Clonal selection is the process of an antigen selecting lymphocytes for cloning. So the antigen is going to select the lymphocyte to clone that will best affect it, which is awesome. So let's review what we've talked about thus far. So we've got innate immunity, which is determined at birth by your genes. And then we've got adaptive immunity. So this is, this is picked up when you're exposed to an antigen or you're given antibodies. So we've got active immunity, which develops after you're exposed to an antigen. The body will make its own antibodies. This can be naturally or artificially acquired. So naturally acquired active immunity develops after you're exposed to an antigen. Artificially is going to develop after given an antigen to prevent the disease, like a vaccine, for example. Passive immunity is produced by transfer of antibodies from another source. This can also be natural or artificial. Naturally acquired passive immunity. An example is when maternal antibodies pass through the breast milk to the infant. Or if you're given antibodies to fight or prevent a disease. So there's four properties of adaptive immunity. We've got specificity where T or B cells respond only to specific antigens and will completely ignore all the others. Versatility, the body produces many types of lymphocytes and each one can fight a different type of antigen. An activated lymphocyte will clone itself to fight a specific antigen. Memory, some Inactive lymphocytes or memory cells, so these guys are not active, but they'll stay in the circulation and provide immunity against a new exposure. So if you get re-exposed 
these memory cells are still hanging out and they're ready to go if you come across this uh, same antigen again. The immune system will ignore normal antigens, which we also call self antigens. Tolerance when the immune system ignores normal antigens. T cells are activated by an exposure to, exposure to an antigen, as we talked about before. Um, the antigen presentation, so how do the T cells really get exposed to the antigen in the first place? T cells can only recognize antigens that are presented by antigen presenting cells. MHC proteins, these are membrane glycoproteins that will bind antigens and are genetically coded by major histocompatibility complex or MHC in chromosome six. So we're gonna actually use MHC as our abbreviation as we go through the next few slides and images. There are two classes of MHC proteins. We have class one MHC proteins. These are found in the membrane of any cell with a nucleus. They're gonna pick up peptides in the cell and carry them to the surface. The T cells will ignore normal peptides, but any abnormal ones or viral proteins will activate the T cell to destroy the cell. So let's take a look at how this would actually work. So we're gonna start with, this is our cell, and here's our nucleus. There's our endoplasmic reticulum and our Golgi. Okay, so all this is, this is a nucleated cell like we talked about. So we're going to have a class one MHC protein. Okay. Okay, so the bacterial pathogen has invaded the nucleated cell. Abnormal peptides will appear in the cytoplasm. These abnormal peptides are incorporated into a class one MHC protein as they are made in the ER. So here's our class one MHC protein, which looks a bit like a horseshoe. So it is going to grab on to the peptides and then will be sent to the Golgi and the Golgi will push those out via transport vesicle. The class 1 MHC protein, which is right here in black, reaches the plasma membrane through transport vesicles and presents that abnormal peptide. It's kind of cool. It's a little bit like it's throwing up a red flag to let the T cells know, hey, come over here and deal with this because it shouldn't be here. So we're throwing up a red flag. This is how the class 1 MHC protein will work. Class 2 MHC proteins are found in the membranes of lymphocytes and antigen presenting cells, like dendritic cells. They will form, or we will see antigenic fragments from antigen processing of the pathogens. Those will, will bind to the class 2 proteins and will be inserted into the plasma membrane. The APC will then present the protein antigen complex to the T cells. So this is, this is pretty sim similar, but let's look at it so we can actually tell what the differences are. So we have a class two MHC protein situation here, which could happen in a lymphocyte or a dendritic cell. We've got a bacterium that is being phagocytized. So the phagocytic APC will engulf the pathogen. Okay, so we're engulfing the pathogen. Then a lysosome, remember the little sacs of digestive enzymes, will actually fuse with this bacterial capsule and dissolve it. So once it's done that, we'll see the ER making class two MHC proteins. So here's our little horseshoe, our little class two MHC proteins antigenic fragments that are left over from us chewing up that bacteria. So when we dissolved the bacteria, we, had, we have antigenic fragments. These will bind to the class two MHC proteins, which will then be embedded in the plasma membrane and presented to the T cells. 
So again, we're up here on the outside of the cell, throwing up a red flag, letting the T cells know, get over here and deal with this because it's not good. Pretty fancy. Antigen recognition. So inactive T cells have receptors that will bind to a class one or class two MHC protein and also have binding sites for specific antigens. But binding can only occur when an antigen matches a receptor on the T cell. Okay, so transitioning into CD markers. So CD markers are also called cluster of differentiation markers. I don't know about you, but I like CD better, way more simple. These are found in the T cell membranes and there are over 350 types. The immune system is really complicated, isn't it? CD3 receptor complex is found in all T cells. Important CD markers. So we have CD8 markers. These are found on cytotoxic T cells and regulatory T cells. They will respond to antigens on class 1 MHC proteins. CD4 markers, these are found on helper T cells and respond to antigens on class 2 MHC proteins. CD8 and CD4 markers will bind to CD3 receptor complex and prepare the cell for activation. We're going to look at all this in a picture. We're just going through the words first. So co-stimulation. So for a T cell to be activated, it has to be co-stimulated by binding to a stimulating cell at a second site, which will confirm the first signal. I'm going to show you this. CD8 T cells are activated by exposure to antigens on class 1 MHC proteins. One responds quickly, producing cytotoxic T cells and memory T cells, and the other will respond slowly, creating regulatory T cells. To destroy the target cell, a cytotoxic T cell can release perforin to destroy a target cell's plasma membrane. And we, we looked at perforin in a previous lympho, um, lymphatic video, so you may want to go back and check that out. Um, it's going to, could either release the perforin or release cytokines and activate genes in the target cell to trigger apoptosis or secrete poisonous lymphotoxin. So let's take a look at this through an image, which hopefully will make it make a little more sense. So here we have an infected cell. Okay. Um, and inside the cell, we have a viral or bacterial antigen. On the surface of the cell, this little U-shaped guy right here, that's a class 1 MHC protein. And then over here, we have an inactive CD8 T cell. Inactive CD8 T cell. Between the two, we've got an antigen. So the little red thing is an example of the antigens that are in here. Okay, so antigen recognition will occur when a CD8 T cell encounters an appropriate antigen on the surface of another cell. So here you can see the encounter is happening right here. And this antigen is bound to a class 1 MHC protein. So we looked at how that gets there in the previous image we went over. Okay. Okay, so I want to zoom in on this dotted line area right here. We're going to blow that up. So take this area right here and let's zoom over here. So what we're looking at, this is our infected cell and our infected cell membrane right here. Here is our CD8 T cell membrane right here. Okay, so we're getting a close up of the class 1 MHC protein and a receptor on the inactive CD8 T cell. Okay, and in between we've got our antigen and then up here we've got some proteins coming off of our T cell called CD8 proteins. So this picture is showing co-stimulation. 
So co-stimulation will activate the CD8 T cell. Before the activation can occur, a T cell must be chemically or physically stimulated by the abnormal target cell. So once we come together, we are getting co-stimulated. So moving down, we have the activation and cell division. So antigen recognition and co-stimulation will result in T cell activation, producing active TC cells and memory TC cells. Active TC cells and memory TC cells. So what can the active T cells do? So let's go to the next picture. The active T cell can destroy the antigen bearing cell. It can use several different mechanisms to kill the target. Let's look at one example here. So here's our active TC cell. You can see it is binding to the infected cell by way of connecting through this antigen being presented. So what it can do is it can release perforin and that will destroy or lyse the cell, which we can see in this example. We could also release cytokine, which will stimulate apoptosis. Or we can release lymphotoxin, which can disrupt the cell's metabolism. Memory T cells are produced with cytotoxic T cells. These will remain in circulation and will immediately form cytotoxic T cells if the same antigen shows up again. Regulatory T cells will secrete suppression factors to inhibit responses of T and B cells. They will act after the initial immune response to limit the immune reaction to a single stimulus.